The Steve Lobby Agency presents The Christian Publishing Show, a podcast for writers who want to advance Christ's kingdom using the written word. Here's your host, Thomas Umstadt Jr. In this episode of The Christian Publishing Show, I am going to do a special solo episode where I would like to share a podcast version of the talk I gave at the ECPA Leadership Summit. So ECPA is the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association, and this is an event where leaders of the various publishing houses gather to talk about trends and the future of the industry, and it is a uh, no-recording conference, so none of the sessions were recorded. And I was asked to give a talk regarding the future of audiobooks and podcasts, and I wanted to share a special encore recording of that uh, session with you, uh, the listeners of the Christian publishing show. Uh, So with that, let's jump into it. Before we talk about the future, I want to talk a little bit about the past. As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Do you see something that is new? Really, it is old. The title of this talk is How Everything Has Changed and Nothing is New, The Future of Audiobooks and Podcasts. So where did we come from? Well, if you go back to the days of Homer, who wrote uh, the classic uh, books, the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey, those books were not books when they were written. They were poems. And the reason why they were poems is that poetry is a great form for memorization so that the audio version of the story could be reproduced. Uh, Poetry helps ensure that the recording doesn't get degraded from generation to generation, that people uh, remember it correctly, because if you misremember a word or a phrase, it breaks the iambic pentameter that those books were written in, or at least I believe that that's uh, what the books were written in. But regardless, the primary version was seen as the audio version for hundreds of years. If we fast forward to the New Testament, it was the same way. If we look at the letters written by Paul and James and Peter, the idea was that those letters would reproduce the audio version of what the apostle was saying at a different place in a different time. And it's it's even mentioned in the Bible. James 122 says, be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourself. So you could imagine the book of James was like an audio cassette where uh, the purpose of the document was to reproduce that audio version. And the assumption was that people would listen to it. In fact, uh, one of the things I learned at the talk, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, yeah, uh, reading requires different parts of the brain. And in fact, people, when they read in these days, even the reading was done out loud. So the whole purpose of reading was to create the audio version so that you can hear it. In fact, St. Augustine marvels at this uh, monk who also became a saint who was able to read silently. His eyes just glanced upon the page and he received illumination. And this was this shocking thing that somebody could read silently. Books were loud experiences. And of course, along comes the printing press and it changes Uh, the way that we interact with books. Suddenly, everyone in church can afford to have their own copy of the Bible. But here's what's interesting. Even so, most churches on most Sundays still include someone reading a passage from the scriptures out loud. Why? Why not just have everyone turn to a certain passage and read it silently? Uh, There's something special about the spoken word and encountering books in their original audio format. Uh, Now, what happened, though, as more people got books, is that the reading of books and the ability to read silently transitioned from something that was rare uh, and, like, astonishing. It was like a feat of, you know, an amazing person in the reading Olympics is able to read silently. Suddenly everyone who can read can read silently. And the way that stories were told changed as well. The idea of where the story was encountered is not through the ears, the normal way, but through the eyes, this new different way of doing it. Poetry changed from a memorization tool to an art form. 
in reading transformed from a loud activity to a silent one. Although what's interesting here is that the desire to listen to books never went away. In fact, many of us first fell in love with books while listening to our parents read them to us as children. So the reading aloud of books, the listening to stories through our ears, has always been a way that we've encountered stories from the earliest days until the present. Now, the cassette tape gave us the ability to listen again. Uh, For the first time, you can hear C.S. Lewis in his own voice, in his own incredibly thick British accent, present the material from the uh, Four Loves, and you can hear him in his own voice. This is a step up from having somebody else read the words of Paul, but not the voice of Paul. Suddenly, the performance itself can be preserved. And cassette tapes were really a great format for audiobooks. They held up to two hours of audio, and they picked up where you left off. So you could listen in your car, you could pop out the cassette tape, you could take it into your house, pop it in, pick up the story right where you left off. You could then take it out of your home stereo system, put it in your Walkman, continue the story. The story could follow you around. Then came the dark days of compact discs. CDs were inferior uh, to cassettes for audiobooks in pretty much every way. They held less audio and they didn't retain your playback position from device to device. If you took the CD of your audiobook home and put it in your stereo, suddenly you're back at chapter one. Uh, which was terrible, or chapter seven, because you needed so many CDs. So a book that might fit on two cassettes might need four CDs to play. And not only that, but producing four CDs was more expensive than producing two cassettes, significantly more expensive, which meant the cost of audiobooks went up. It's not uncommon in the days of CDs for audiobooks to cost $30, $40 for an audiobook. And this actually is a justified expense based off of how expensive CDs are to produce. And I know this intimately because um, I started an audiobook production company when I was in college. It was my first business. It was my uh, business plan for my entrepreneurship class. And I actually launched this business. We sold products to customers. We went to trade shows. And it was all based around making CDs. And I know intimately just how expensive and time-consuming it is to have you know, a dozen CDs for one book. It's just a mess. Then along came the iPod. Now, the iPod was magical when it came to audiobooks because one iPod could hold an entire library of books. A Bible that filled 79 CDs could fit on a single iPod. Not only that, but iPods got better, cheaper, and smaller every year until finally they vanished altogether into our uh, smartphones. We all have an iPod in our pockets. In fact, that's probably how you're listening to this podcast right now. And by the way, if you are listening to this podcast on your computer uh, using the browser, this is the worst way to listen. I'm glad you're listening, and I'm really impressed you've made it this far into the episode. I would like to tell you that there is a better way, and that better way is to use an app on your phone to get new episodes automatically. It allows you to increase playback speed. It remembers where you left off. There's a better way to do podcasts. All right, back to you, audiobooks. Now, the final technology that was a big uh, move forward was the ability to connect your iPod to your car. Now, this has technically existed for over a decade. Back when I was running that audiobook business, I was able to connect my iPod to my car. But the reality is most people did not know how to do this, uh, or they were unwilling to go and buy the cable that allowed them to plug it in. But recently, as car entertainment systems have gotten more sophisticated, they've gotten easier to connect your phone to. Not only that, but some of modern cars, like brand new cars, use your phone as the key. So you can't even start the car until your phone is connected. So you just, if you have a Tesla, for instance, you just, it senses that you're there because you have your phone in your pocket. It unlocks, you open the car, you push the button to start. You never have to bother with a key. It's really a remarkable experience. And the Tesla assumes that your phone is going to be connected to your car. And then you can just tell your car, play the Christian publishing show or whatever podcast you want to listen to or whatever audiobook you want to listen to and boom it starts playing it's an amazing experience and this is where things 
are headed. Uh, more and more people are getting these kinds of cars, and, and it's not just Teslas. It's really all uh, modern cars, especially luxury cars, have these kinds of technologies uh, built in. But the things that are in the luxury cars uh, in one decade are in all the cars uh, the next decade. So it does trickle down uh, the price points. And uh, this has really changed the way that people uh, listen to audiobooks. In fact, in 2018, audiobook listening in the United States jumped to 51%, as did podcast listening. So for the first time in history, more people have listened to an audiobook or a podcast than haven't. It has jumped the chasm. If you have not listened to an audiobook, if you don't listen to audiobooks, you are now technically a laggard. You're no longer an early adopter. The majority has already moved onto this audio form of uh, consumption of content. And the demand for audio is higher than ever before because of how easy it is to consume the audio. Having an iPod or an iPhone, an app on your phone that plays the audiobook or the podcast is such a better experience than dealing with discs or cassette tapes. It's just unmeasurably better experience while at the same time being a cheaper experience. The delivery has gotten so much cheaper. You no longer have to manufacture a dozen audio, uh, a dozen CDs to deliver your book or hire somebody to a bridge. Cause that was the other way that um, this problem was solved back in the day is that you get an abridged version. You'd hire an editor to do a whole nother pass and abridge the, um, say 300 page book down into a 50 page book and what you ended up with was just the worst (laughs) it was the abridging process was often really took the life out of the book so the cost of delivering the audio has gone down while at the same time the cost of producing the audio has also gone down production costs for audio are collapsing Uh, Back in the day, if you were to build an analog studio, it was not unreasonable to spend $50,000 or more, maybe $100,000 or more for a studio. The gear, the mixers, the microphones, the uh, tapes for recording were all incredibly expensive. And the act of recording was expensive because you had to record onto tape that you had to actually buy. Um, I don't know how people lived in an analog world. My hat is off to them. You made the world the way it is, and I just would like to say thank you. You're all Captain America in my book. Uh, But then digital studios came down, and suddenly instead of spending $100,000 for a studio, you could build a good studio for $10,000. But then home studios came around, and for as little as $150, you can sound very similar to that far more expensive sound. In fact, for $1,000, you can be nearly indistinguishable. Uh, it's it's really remarkable. And actors all over the country are building thousands of home studios. There are home studios in pretty much every town. The number of audiobook narrators has gone through the roof. You suddenly have a lot of choices. And if you're out of work and you have a decent voice and you can read smoothly, you'd be surprised how much money you could make as an audiobook narrator. Now is a great time to read audiobooks for a living. It's never been easier to get gigs and you don't need a college education. All you need is about $1,000 worth of equipment, uh, sometimes even less. I know audiobook narrators who do major books uh, for major companies, and I think they've spent $500 on their setup. Uh, so these falling costs, both from the production side and the delivery side, have triggered a podcasting boom and an audiobook boom. The amount of content is soaring. The amount of content created and added to Audible uh, in 2018 exceeded, if I understand correctly, the total amount of audio on Audible like 10 years before. Like it's just unbelievable the rate of growth as more and more companies and more and more authors are making audiobooks uh, of their books. And as we're talking about audiobooks and podcasts, I do want to clarify One way to think of this is that audiobooks are like movies. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end, very high production values, uh, and it's a complete package. You're supposed to walk away from an audiobook with a feeling of satiation. You're satisfied, you're happy, you've had a powerful emotional moment. If it's nonfiction, you feel smarter and more enlightened. If it's fiction, you've had a powerful experience with the characters. Podcasts are more like television. Now, uh, where it's ongoing and, you know, every week there's another episode of the show um, and it doesn't have that same beginning, middle and end. Now, I will say um, the gap, quality gap between 
podcasts and audiobooks is closing, just like the gap between movies and TV is closing. And I'm very excited. This week is the launch of the next season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is Marvel's TV show uh, that goes hand in hand with the movies. And it, you know, it's often kind of the background stuff. So the movies are happening in the background, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. These are the people often who have to clean up the mess after Thor Rex London. These are the people who clean up, uh, clean up the rubble. It's a very fun show, and it feels like a high budget Marvel movie while being a much lower budget television show. Now you uh, you may be thinking podcasting is this new hip thing that all the kids are doing, but believe it or not, podcasting is actually one of the oldest forms of digital media. It is arguably the last remaining form of Web 1.0 content. Uh, There's no central hub for podcasts. There's no company that controls podcasts. So while Google controls YouTube, which is the home of YouTube, and Facebook controls Facebook.com, which is the home of Facebook, and it can delete you and ban you, there's nobody to do that in podcasting. It's a direct relationship between you, the podcaster, and your listener, which is really powerful. And as Christians, really good news because our message is not loved by the world. And these big companies are already starting to censor Christian content that they disagree with. Um, So the fact that they can't censor podcasts as easily is really good news for us. Uh, And it's something that really needs to be protected. And it makes sense, right? The technology behind podcasts is the same technology behind Napster, Right? The MP3, the untraceable audio file, it doesn't call back, it doesn't report on you. Uh, it's a beautiful technology. It's freedom. It's digital freedom in a file format. It's beautiful. And to give you an idea of how long podcasting has been around, before Twitter was a microblogging platform, it was a podcasting company called Odeo. So when the Jack Dorsey launched uh, the company that became Twitter, he initially launched it as a podcasting company uh, before he made the transition to becoming a Web 2.0 microblogging platform. So there's a little trivia for those of you keeping score at home. So, uh, as I've already said, the technology behind the audiobook boom is also powering the podcasting boom. And the fundamental thing you have to understand is that audio is not a fad. It is the original way that we encounter stories. What you could say is a fad is the reading with your eyes on paper. That, historically, is the new thing. It's not that new. I mean, we've been doing it for thousands of years, and with the printing press, it's been available to more people. But audio has been around longer. And that's the most important thing to take away from this is that it's not some new thing that we've just now discovered. It's gotten cheaper and easier, but it's always been around from the earliest um, humans telling stories around the campfire. How did they experience those stories through their ears? Now, let's talk about the changes that are coming and how as a publisher or as an independent author, you handle these changes. And change is like a wave. If you've ever been in high surf, uh, if you fight a wave, you get water up your nose. But if you work with the wave, you can ride to shore and have a lot of fun. So let's talk about how to surf the changes. Uh, So audio is just exploding in popularity. Uh, there is the growth year over year. It's uh, is just astounding. We're talking twenty to thirty percent growth every year. So we went from audiobooks being a billion dollar business five or six years ago to being a two billion dollar business, over two billion dollar business this year, and likely going to be a three billion dollar business soon. So the in terms of pie, the audiobook pie is growing at a rapid, rapid rate, as is the podcasting pie. So here are my five suggestions for handling um, these changes into the future. And the first is to publish every book in audio. So for those of you listening who are uh, publishers, you're either an independent publisher or you publish your own books, if it's worth it to publish a book, it's worth it to publish it in audio. And some of you may be saying, oh, but it's too expensive. I can't afford it. And in response, I will say the system you have is perfectly designed to give you the results that you are getting. And if you have not experienced the falling cost of audiobook production, you've got to change something. You got it. If you're in sourcing, you need to outsource. If you're outsourcing and you're not happy with that, you need to try licensing. If you're licensing and it's not ha- working, you need to perhaps try producing it yourself, but outsourcing the production. There are a lot of ways to bring the cost down. And if you haven't looked into it and you're 
still paying the prices of five years ago or the prices of 10 years ago, all of those cost savings are being made by the person selling you the service. The person you're giving the money is laughing to the bank. You could be laughing to the bank if you're willing to make some changes. And I will say, uh, for those of you who are authors who are listening, it is critical that you negotiate the audio rights effectively for your book. And this is where having an agent really comes in uh, to play. And, and for agencies, I recommend the Steve Lobby Agency. We have a lot of excellent agents who know their way around audio. But the most important thing I will say when it comes to audio is to either negotiate that they will for sure make an audiobook, which is the best case scenario. If they publish your book, they publish their audiobook. But if they don't, you it's critical that you negotiate that those rights to the audiobook revert back to you so that you can make the audiobook. Because you can actually, believe it or not, make an audiobook for free at acx.com. It will match you up with a narrator. They audition. You get to pick your narrator. The narrator gets half the money. You get half the money. And you pay nothing and you have an audiobook. So making an audiobook is very cheap and easy for you as an author. But only if you have the rights. What happens, if with especially with poorly negotiated negotiated uh, publishing deals. If you don't have an agent, this is very easy to happen where the publisher has the rights to your audiobook without the requirement to do anything with those rights, which means that your book is stuck in audiobook purgatory where you are legally prohibited from making the audiobook yourself and you have no ability to force your publisher to make an audiobook for you. That is what is to be avoided. <laughs> There's no reason for that in 2019 for a book not to exist in audio. This market is growing too quickly. The costs are falling too fast. There's just no reason for it. It would be like not publishing your book as an ebook. It's just like, why? You're leaving money on the table. All right, the second thing to do uh, as a publishing company is to equip your authors to go on podcast tours. So just how TV and audio help promote each other, right? If I'm a big fan of Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the likelihood of me going and seeing the latest Avengers game, uh, Avengers movie or Spider-Man movie is very, very high. And it's the same with people who've heard your authors on podcasts. The likelihood of them going to buy a book is very high. In fact, podcast listeners consume, I think, twice as many audiobooks as non-podcast listeners. They're just a huge audiobook um, consuming population. And I will say as a podcaster, I don't like having guests on my podcast who don't have good audio. You'd be surprised how little it costs to have halfway decent audio. So for $25, you can get the Logitech H390 USB headset. And I'll have a link to this headset in the show notes. So you can click and get exactly the right headset on Amazon. This is a USB headset. It plugs into your laptop. And the fact that it's a headset eliminates echoes. So if you've ever been on a conference call and somebody had an echo, the reason they had an echo is that they were on speaker and the audio was coming out of their computer and back into the microphone on their computer. So when the speakers and the microphone are on the same device, you almost inevitably get an echo, which creates all kinds of audio problems. You get the same problem actually at live performances, except that audio loops back, 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 faster and faster until it turns into, within seconds, a high-pitched whine. So if you've ever heard the speaker scream at you, it's because somebody got a microphone too close to the speaker. So that's some uh, free audio production tips. Now, this headset is good, it's not great. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about better equipment in the next tip. Uh, so tip number three is to help your authors start their own podcasts. Or if you're wanting to get published, Starting a podcast can be a great way to build a platform and build an influential audience. People who listen to podcasts make more money, uh, they're better educated, and they're more influential. So when somebody tells me they're not a podcast listener, I know that they're in a statistical group that is less influential, uh, less wealthy, and less educated. Uh, it doesn't guarantee that they're those things, but statistically, it means that it's very likely. Uh, if you don't know how to listen, how can you learn? If the only way you know how to learn is by reading with your eyes, you're really limiting your ability to learn. Hope, and, and the, which is, I think, why the people who listen make more money because hopefully they know how to read too. Some people can't, right? They can't see or they uh, have reading challenges. 
uh, but the people who can listen have a huge advantage. So starting your own podcast, very, very valuable and has never been cheaper uh, or easier. When I was a kid, I started my first podcast in 2007. And we had to chisel our MP3s on stone tablets. It was so hard. Uh, The recording was so difficult. Interviewing somebody far away was such a hassle. I had to loop the audio through this uh, software called Audio Hijack Pro. I had to hijack the audio from Skype and loop it through. And it was just so complicated. And it has gotten so easy now. Uh, The microphone, though, that I recommend, if you're going to do lots of guest interviews or if you're going to have your own podcast is the Audio Technica ATR 2100 USB microphone. What I like about this microphone, first off, it's only $70, so it's very cheap. And two, it sounds amazing. Uh, You would be stunned how many podcasts you listen to that use this uh, microphone. But the third is that it can plug directly into your computer, so it's the only equipment you need, or you can plug it into a mixer. It has both plugs on it which means it can grow with you as you grow your podcast, which is very exciting. Now, the second thing you need to buy are a good pair of headphones. You can isolate the sound around your ears. If you're going to have a big microphone in front of you, you have to isolate that sound. You can't listen through earbuds or, God forbid, it, you know your laptop speakers because you're going to create a terrible, terrible echo. And the software ways of eliminating this echo reduce the quality of the audio significantly. Uh, So the headphones that I recommend are the Audio-Technica ATH M30X headphones. These are great headphones. They're a little pricey, but they'll help you in editing uh, and music will sound amazing in them. So this is, so here we're at another $70. And then the third thing I recommend is a scissor arm. And I'll have a link uh, to one of these in the show notes as well. It's about 20 bucks. And this allows you to have the uh, microphone on your desk and just kind of pull it down and put it right where you want it. And this helps protect you from shocks and bumps uh, becoming booms on the microphone. I have one of these and it helps uh, reduce booms. If I can, I'll jostle my microphone to give you an idea of what this could sound like. So that's... Uh, that's the sort of thing that if you don't have one of these arms can show up in the audio uh, quite a bit. And I'll have links to all of this gear in the show notes. There'll be affiliate links. So if you want to help us out, click on one of those links and Amazon will send me a little something, something for sending you there. Uh, Some of these will be affiliate links. Some of them will not. All right. So the fourth tip is to cultivate an ad network of mid-tier podcasts. Uh, A big reason behind Audible's success is, and why it became the dominant audiobook player is not because, I believe, Amazon bought them. I believe that they were successful, and that is why they Amazon bought them. Amazon didn't buy some broken company to make it successful. They were already successful. And what was the secret of their success? Advertising on podcasts. This is one of the most powerful advertising tools. It's why the Christian Writers Institute sponsors uh, the Christian Publishing Show. It's because this is our audience, right? If you're the kind of person who's going to listen to a uh, podcast about you know, learning how to write better and about the industry, the likelihood of you wanting to take a course that's $10 or $30 on how to become a better writer is very, very high. And so it's a great combination. And quick plug, if you use the coupon code PODCAST, you'll save 10% on checkout at the Christian Writers Institute, and that coupon code works on every course in the store. There are more Christian podcasts than any other kind of podcast. More Christian podcasts than news, more Christian podcasts than comedy, uh, more than society and culture. Every category has fewer podcasts than religion and spirituality, colon, Christianity on iTunes, which is the biggest repository of podcasts on the internet. And and by a significant margin. So I think Christian Christianity is ahead by like 10,000 podcasts. So it has 40,000 podcasts. The next biggest category has 30,000 podcasts. Why? Why are there so many Christian podcasts? Well, I'll tell you. 
Sermons. <laughs> so many churches post their sermons online, and those sermons are also available via podcast. In fact, I would say most Christians have listened to a podcast already, whether they realize it or not. There are also tons of non-sermon-related Christian podcasts, which means that the publishers uh, who create ad networks of these mid-tier podcasts, the ones where nobody is currently advertising on those podcasts, podcasts like the Christian Publishing Show. Uh, you know, no one has approached us wanting to buy ads because no one sees the Christian market as being valuable. And if you listen to Christian podcasts, often the advertisers are Audible or Casper mattresses or other generic products for generic people where if you're a Christian publisher, you could advertise to a highly optimized audience very inexpensively and very effectively. And I will say, after I gave this talk at the ECPA Leadership Summit, several people came up to me with plans of making these ad networks. So I will not be surprised if come a year from now, uh, there will be several rival ad networks of uh, podcast networks that you can advertise on. Some of them will be proprietary to publishing houses. So uh, Acme Publishing has their own uh, network of podcasts that they buy ads on, whereas some of the others may be available uh, for uh, anyone to buy ads on, and they will help match you or match your book with podcasts that are a good fit. That's all I can say. It's all speculation right now. Nothing has happened. I just gave the talk a few days ago, but I talked with several people who had some very cool ideas. And um, as those things come into flourishing, as they exist, as these networks are made, uh, expect me to introduce you to them here on the Christian Publishing Show. So I want to help these uh, exist. And if you're an indie um, uh, author and you're publishing yourself, you can kind of on the spur of the moment put together an ad hoc network just by reaching out to podcasts and saying, hey, can I advertise on your podcast? Or looking to see if they're on Patreon or buying a Patreon sponsorship level that allows you to uh, place an ad. You can do a guerrilla version of this. This isn't just for the big dogs. All right, the fifth and final tip is to embrace smart speakers. So one of the things I asked the audience is, since the last ECPA Leadership Summit last year, how much do you think the smart speaker market has grown in popularity? And I had everyone raise their hands at, who thinks 10% or more? Who thinks 25% or more? And I went all the way up to 150% or more, and almost no one had their hands up at that much growth, when in reality, the smart speaker market in the last year has grown 187%. That is not a small number. That is a huge number. Uh, and it's the fastest growth curve we've ever seen for a consumer electronics device, for a consumer electronics uh, product. Faster than televisions, faster than the personal computer, faster than the internet, faster than iPods, faster than iPhones, like smartphones. The, the adoption of smart speakers has been significantly faster than smartphones. The adoption is just super crazy high. And now... The people who don't have one yet often cite privacy concerns like, oh, I don't want Amazon listening to what I say. And yet often those exact same people have Hey Siri or OK Google set up on their phones so that their phone is listening to them all the time, not just when they're at home, but everywhere. There's nowhere that they go that they don't have a big tech company listening to them. So at that point, uh, it's just a matter of who do you trust more, Amazon or Apple? Now, I will say I turn off Hey Siri. I don't have that feature turned on because I don't want my phone constantly recording everything I say. But if you didn't change it in the settings, if you just click next a bunch of times and you set up your phone, there's a very good chance your phone's already listening to you. So those privacy concerns are mostly media hype, <laughs> right? The media is hyping privacy issues relating to Amazon's Echo. They're not hyping privacy issues relating to Siri or to Google. Uh, and because of that, the fear is around the home speakers. Uh, one of the things I recommended to everyone at the at the summit was to buy an Echo uh, Dot. They're $30. I'll put a link in the show notes, an affiliate link, if you want uh, to get one. Chances are, statistically, you already have one. Uh, but the reason I recommend getting one is to start to understand how these speakers are changing the world uh, and how people are starting to account, engage with content more via audio than they are via text. And uh, also, you can buy audiobooks with your speaker. You can say, you can tell Alexa that you want to buy a speaker, 
and suddenly, uh, or sorry, you can tell Alexa you want to buy an audiobook. She buys you an audiobook. You can have her play you an audiobook. And suddenly you're listening to an audiobook all right there on your smart speaker. So to get an idea of where the world is headed so that you're not collapsed by the wave, consider buying a $30 Echo Dot just to play with it, just as a toy. If it makes you uncomfortable, you can unplug it. In fact, you can return it. I think Amazon's got a 30-day return policy. So you can just get it for 30 days, and if it freaks you out too much, you return it and cite privacy issues. Uh, But my guess is that you're going to want to keep it because of how useful it becomes. We control our house with our uh, Alexa device. We get the weather and the news sometimes. The the point here is that um, you can do a lot of really powerful things with your Echo. It's a very powerful tool, and it's a powerful book-selling tool if you want to use it. Again, this is all optional, but you'd be surprised how powerful it is. And it's not just useful for audiobooks. It's also useful for podcasts. People listen to podcasts on their smart speakers. Uh, especially short form podcasts can get added to uh, Alexa's flash briefing. So if you get your weather, you get the traffic to work, you get the news and you get your short um, podcast. And I will say one of my clients, my podcast production clients, a Married to Moves Pray Every Day podcast is incredibly popular. Uh, flash briefing. People will add it as their flash briefing and listen to her daily prayer um, during their flash briefing. So it's a very powerful tool in that regard. So the final story features the found, uh, the president of the Evangelical Christian Publishing Association, Stan Jantz, who listened to the podcast episode Building a Story Brand, where uh, this hosted by Donald Miller, where they interview Ian Crone, the author of The Road Back to You. And Stan was so impressed with the podcast that he went out and bought the book and started recommending it to other people. A few weeks later, he happened to be talking to Corey Verner, the founder of ChristianAudio.com, and Stan asked or, uh, Corey if the Story Brand podcast had impacted sales, and Corey was like, oh yes, that book is now our number one best-selling audiobook, and according to Corey, he had no doubt that the podcast was the primary reason. And so, uh, if you want to be able to hit these kinds of numbers and really surf the wave into the future and be a part of this growing trend of more and more people adopting audio like they did in times of old, I encourage you to embrace podcasts, subscribe and listen to podcasts, and uh, get your books on audiobook and perhaps even listen to some books on audio. I hope this has been helpful. The special, it's ended up being an expanded edition when I didn't have a a tight time window. I kept going and going, Uh, but hopefully this has been helpful. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, subscribe to get new episodes on your smartphone. Uh, The app that I recommend is CastBox. It works on Android and on iPhone. It allows you to easily and quickly subscribe to podcasts like The Christian Publishing Show. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for listening to The Christian Publishing Show. For more information and to get episodes delivered to your phone automatically, visit christianpublishingshow.com.